Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for today's Design Bites. We have this special event on a monthly basis, but this one is an, a special uh, Design Bites. And uh, we're very excited for everyone to to join us on a regular basis. But for those of you who are new, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Luann Shui, and I am the community manager at Hannah House, which is a cafe and co-working space that is um, actually in my background right now. This is what our space looks like. And we normally run our design bites here in the physical space, but due to um, current circumstances, we've moved every event to our virtual space. And so this is a very exciting that we have everyone here today. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, resident UX designer who normally runs the event at Hannah House. And, and he is very passionate about design. And so we're very glad to have him here on a regular basis to have these different programs. And so if you would like, you can also check out our other events at hannahhouse.com slash events because we have uh, um, events in many different fo formats, including science and um, business related, but this is one of our favorite ones. And so without further ado, Dan Waters from SAP. Yeah, thank you so much, Luann. So yes, my, my name is Dan Waters. This is, this is the um, event with, uh, with all of the Dans associated with it, but I um, first wanna say that um, uh, we're very uh, lucky and fortunate to um, uh, be able to work with the HANA House. Uh, we've been running Design Bites events at the HANA House um, for the past couple of years. And usually they're um, hands-on uh, activities where we take a design challenge and we try to come up with solutions together uh, in a sort of hands-on manner. And, and then of course, over this past year, well, we've gone to a virtual format and in the virtual format, we've focused a little bit more on the learning side of things. Uh, and we've had a number of really good uh, interactive virtual sessions together. Uh, and today, this is the first time we've, we've done something like this, but what we wanted to introduce was a, uh, a guest speaker. And so I'm, uh, really excited for the chance to do that and, and for, um, for uh, the content that you're going to hear about today. Uh, and I wanted to introduce uh, our special speaker, uh, Dan Rosenberg. Uh, Dan is a distinguished global UX executive. He's a consultant, uh, professor at San Jose State University, and he's the author of numerous uh, textbooks in the areas of uh, interaction design, usability, and human factors. Uh, he's also the recipient of the 2019 ACM Sid Kai Lifetime Practice Award. And he's the author of the now very recent book called UX Magic, uh, in which he introduces the concept of semantic interaction design, which we're all very interested to hear a little bit more about. Um, he had a career uh, beginning in the 80s uh, as a UI architect for Borland, uh, where Dan invented many of the popular UI design patterns that are in use today, uh, including the use of the tab uh, UI, which uh, as a form of uh, organizational um, practice. And uh, he had roles as a global design leader at companies such as Oracle and SAP. Um, Dan has also been a leading advocate for the role of uh, UX as a key component in product strategy and success um, from the enterprise level uh, to the startup. Um, my own experience with Dan was actually as a designer at SAP. Uh, in fact, Dan hired me for a role there, uh, creating new uh, mobile software products and experiences. So one thing I always remember uh, about Dan was, was actually from my very uh, initial job interview where uh, instead of focusing solely on looking through my design portfolio, um, Dan actually took the time to read through several of my research papers and asked me some very detailed questions about them, uh, which prompted a very lively discussion. And uh, I, in fact, it was on the subject of visual search, as I recall. And that was um, quite unusual for most job interviews. And, and I've always remembered uh, from that time uh, to uh, look past uh, just what someone uh, perhaps uh, uh, puts on the page as a design or, or, or um, uh, interface, but to look into what uh, a person uh, also, uh, how they think and how they work. Um, thanks, Dan, so much for agreeing to be a special speaker today for Design Bites. And 
We look forward now to hearing more about your book, UX Magic, and some of your experiences in the UX field. Thanks, Dan. So thank you for that introduction. And it's good to be virtually back at SAP um, and to uh, be able to share my, the theory and science um, behind my latest book. And let me go and share my screen and please confirm that you see it. And please confirm that um, when I'm changing slides, um, they're changing because I have had trouble, not with Zoom, but um, earlier in the week for another uh, talk I was doing. So <clears throat> when I left the corporate world, which is about eight or more years ago to um, become a professor after a 35 year industry career, um, my goal uh, was for, in doing that was actually to um, teach and interact action design, which is something that I've been an interaction designer, and as Dan Waters mentioned, um, invented a lot of the things. Um, and it is correct that uh, I did invent tabs and it was so long ago that the patent has expired, but um, I was blessed with the fact that Microsoft infringed that patent in Windows 1995. So that's um, a story perhaps for the Q and A period. But as I went to teach, I couldn't find a good book. And I was really surprised because the method that I'm gonna talk about is something that we use at Oracle and at SAP, and I thought was really common practice, um, but it wasn't. So I decided I would write a book after I had taught the graduate students in the Human Factors Engineering Program this material five times, so five years. And I stopped and, um, and wrote the book. Um, and here I am to share it with you. So it starts like this there's a kind of meta question in the design field, right? That is like, what's the first thing you do when you start to create a new design? And let me quantify this for you. So let's assume you have all the requirements and you have your user stories and you have your user journeys and you have this perfectly researched world, which of course doesn't exist, but basically you've got all the information you're gonna get and now you have a blank sheet of paper sitting in front of you. Well, if you go back to what many of the Founders in the field used to say, someone like Bill Buxton, he would say, sketch, just start drawing. It's just a catharsis brainstorming magical period where the designers somehow out of the ether emerge with solutions. And honestly, that's kind of what was taught and uh, it's still taught in some places. And I'm telling you, don't do that. That is actually not the best way to start. I do assure you, you will have to do plenty of sketching eventually. However, jumping right to sketches uh, basically um, is not the way to get to the best design. And it brings a tremendous number of uh, biases um, that you as a designer would have based on your own experience, your knowledge of your company's existing products and competitive products, all of which may be actually suboptimal. So what is it? Semantic interaction design is actually a proven cognitive science-based method. And it's very important that it's scalable. Um, I work on very complicated medical applications and bioscience applications and enterprise applications as a consultant. And I led some very, very large teams of designers on some of the most complicated enterprise systems for over two decades. And it has to scale, but in scaling, we want to achieve a 10x better result and 10x better in efficiency in terms of how fast as designers you can produce something and 10x at least in effectiveness, meaning better quality UX. And I will quantify all of those in a minute for you. I want to acknowledge that I didn't invent this magically. The work on semantic interaction design dates all the way back to Phyllis Riesner in 1979 at IBM Watson Labs, um, with the notion of a task action grammar and the relationship of grammar complexity to even using command line interfaces. It borrows from uh, the field of cognitive science and works by Don Norman, uh, his stages of action theory, 
designed by Levels from Jim Foley, retired professor emeritus at Georgia Tech. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with that name, Jim and Andy Van Dam invented computer graphics as you know it um, a long time ago. Um, Bonnie Nardi's work on activity theory and a bunch of work by Ben Schneiderman. And I know for a fact that Norman Foley and Schneiderman all have a copy of UX Magic um, because A, I've sent it to them and B, they've already given me feedback on the book. There was also a movement in object-oriented UI led by a gentleman named David Collings um, around 1995. So the genesis really starts there. In 2012, Jeff Johnson and Austin Henderson who were both members of the original Xerox PARC team that invented the graphical user interface, published a book called Conceptual Models. And this is the foundation of semantic interaction design, but it's just the bottom layer, which you'll see um, as we progress in this talk. UX magic is the complete system, the complete pedagogy for teaching interaction design and the complete uh, methodology for executing interaction design. Now, the value proposition is very simple. It's faster, better, right? And by faster, I mean fewer stakeholder meetings, efficient science-based trade-offs, fewer iterations to get to the right design. Um, and by optimal design, I mean, most importantly, lowest cognitive load possible, right? And the lowest cognitive load would have the effect of the shortest flows and the minimum number of screens ready um, to, and ready to scale. So these are kind of bold, audacious claims. So let me back it up with just two examples from some of the case studies in the book. When I joined SAP, so we're probably talking 15 years ago, SAP had a uh, legacy CRM system that had thousands of screens. Um, my team um, using the same back end um, with a new HTML UI in one iteration got it down to hundreds of screens. And then as the technology was replatformed to the cloud, got it down to about a dozen in a five screen iPad app, right? So that's a hundred X improvement, just if you go by screen count alone. So I'll explain how this translates to cognitive load, but obviously um, if you can reduce the um, amount of experience by that much cognitive load has dropped exponentially. I want to acknowledge that the cloud version when it came out didn't have 100% of the features because product management had the courage to basically drop a bunch of fringe features. So maybe lost 10, 15% of the functional scope, but it was stuff nobody needed or ever used in decades. Another example is from recent consulting uh, for uh, a company that makes radiation treatment cancer equipment, hardware, and software that surrounds it. And these are screens from a legacy electronic medical record for radiation cancer treatment. It was well over 800 screens. The new product, basically using a modern UX patterns and this method to actually figure out how to do it, got down to about 45 screens. This is a home screen for doctors using a swim lane archetype and kind of an internet of things cards feed. So these are lab results coming in for all the doctor's patients. These are their appointments, some task management, a kind of a social pattern for looking at an individual patient, again, with the internet of things feed and communications running in parallel. And then screens that looked, it's kind of like a typical medical chart, all right? This improvement looks like it's about 18 or 20 X, but actually that's a deceptive number if we went on screen count alone, because the new product handled radiation, chemotherapy, um, genomics and surgery, and had a complete decision support system. The original product only dealt with radiation treatment uh, for cancer. So product scope increased. So the real improvement um, is kind of an order of magnitude probably bigger than the number I'm even quoting here. So those are some proof points to back up my audacious claim of uh, substantial improvement. When would you do this? Well, I wanna be clear, this book and the method are not a full life cycle, right? You'll need to do your user research. Um, you'll need to do your post analysis and usability testing and measuring and iterating and planning 
And actually, this is the UCD diagram from the era when I um, was the SVP of UX at SAP. I'm sure they have a better one now. But the point is simply the zone that UX magic focuses on is after all the research is done, that uh, magical creative catharsis time when you start to execute an interaction design project. All the other phases are important, but necessary, but not sufficient. So why, why is this important? Well, there's a myth that, you know, you can just A-B test your way to success in the world of um, internet-based products with lots of um, measurement built in. And that's basically not true, right? These current methods of just throw and stick and see what happens, which is very popular here in Silicon Valley where I'm coming to you from, um, just simply doesn't work. Real quality is not achieved by iterating and eliminating defects. Real quality occurs at the beginning of the design process. Now, how do you do this? I'm gonna break the how into two parts, the theory and the practice. There's two cognitive science principles that work at four modular levels in interaction design. And I will walk you through the levels with real examples of grammar visualization, so design pattern selection, flow design, and optionally game theory. But let's talk about the two cognitive principles first. The first one is that language, natural language is the basis of conscious thought for human beings. Natural language is not the basis of all thought. We have the primitive brain, which deals with the fight and flight mechanism and our amorous intentions. But whenever you have to solve a problem of any complexity whatsoever, that is like a puzzle to learn something new, you operate with your own natural language, usually in your mother tongue, or certainly in a and it's natural language you speak very well. And that's how you think about things. And we know for a fact that language grammar correlates with cognitive load. And we know, for example, that Mandarin Chinese is a more complex language than English. And English is a more complex language than any of the Semitic languages like Hebrew or Arabic, for example. Cognitive load can be measured in, an, in, in a usability lab. And if you don't know how to do that, you can ask me in the Q&A. Um, but what I'm telling you, which might seem kind of miraculous, is that cognitive load for an interaction design concept can be predicted in advance before you actually draw the first screen. Sounds a little amazing, doesn't it? So let me talk about grammar and what I mean by grammar, just so everybody's clear. If we go back to the origin of the graphical user interface 30 years ago, we have the notion of actions, which you would tend to see in menus like cut, copy, paste, and the notion of objects that people select and fit their mental model um, that they would operate on. And all objects have a set of attributes. So in the case of a drawing product, it can be colors and fonts. But in the case of other products I'm gonna show you, it's a little bit more abstract. So in my career, I've had the opportunity to be involved in the UX design of four word processors. One I designed from scratch at Borland. Um, the other three were redesigns. T two of them were actually DOS products. So that's how long ago it was. And these early word processors had very, very, very bad um, conceptual models. So where users would understand the notion of a character, word, or paragraph, a page, and document as being the objects that they were manipulating in this new digital world. Um, the actions that were applied to them were inconsistent, redundant, um, and generally mapped to function keys on the keyboard or key commands. And you'd have a different key for like removing a character than for removing a word. And you'd have a different name for that action. And the same thing, so it was redundant and um, inconsistent. So this is what I refer to as the sparse object action grammar and sparse is bad. The inventors of the graphical user interface brought us to the notion of a dense object action grammar where actions would not only be standardized across applications, but they would be standardized across an entire operating system. 
And so now with cut, copy, paste, for example, um, in a perfect world, there would be no exceptions. And these are the objects in a word processor, but they could be a spreadsheet, they could be a social uh, media, they could be on a mobile phone, it doesn't really matter. And so while um, it should be intuitively obvious to everybody that dense is better than sparse, the math um, is important. And I wanna explain what the math looks like. In a perfect world, if you have a scalar value approximation of cognitive load, the perfectly dense matrix grows in complexity that it places on human beings linearly. So think of the formulas being actions plus objects. And as this matrix gets really sparse and sloppy, um, it grows exponentially. And you could approximate this um, with the number of actions times the number of objects. Now, if you happen to have a PhD in cognitive science, forgive me for not putting in a couple of coefficients here, whatever, but it's irrelevant to the premise of why semantic interaction design is so important. One question that comes up, um, particularly from those <laughs> with a background in cognitive science is, what's the inflection point in the exponential curve? And it appears to be um, based on the research we've done, about 20 or 30%. So 20 or 30% white space is when you're gonna hit um, the inflection point because you will never have a perfectly dense matrix in the real world. An example of one is from the medical product um, that I spoke about before, this 800 to 45 screen example um, with a bunch of research and iteration um, we were able to figure out that you could represent all of cancer treatment and perhaps all of medical treatment with only eight objects, the patient, the medical record, so the history going backward, the treatment plan going forward, and then a bunch of procedural things like appointments and messages, um, and then the care team, because when you have cancer, you have a lot of doctors. It's not just one and they need to coordinate. And then there is data that's being created and updated you do not delete in a medical product. You only strike out with a void action. And then there's a lot of workflow um, that happens. And so there's a bunch of actions like accept, reject, delegate, approve, transfer, and then refer is a medically specific one um, because you're often referring the patient from one medical practitioner or clinician to another. Okay, so that's the real life. And we'll take a deeper look at this, but that represents all of cancer treatment and that is how you go from hundreds, 800, 900 screens down to a couple dozen. So now let's look at how in practice. And I'm gonna walk you through um, from the bottom up this particular pyramid. And we're gonna start at the grammar level. Okay, where do objects and actions come from? Well, in the object oriented computer science world, uh, from Dave Collins, there's a process called foraging for nouns, right? So obviously the natural language construct, um, a noun represents an object, a verb represents an action, and an adjective would represent the attribute of some object. There is a process that we're gonna follow, um, and that's basically first defining the objects and actions and reducing it to the tightest, most dense model possible enumerating the attributes for every object and then prioritizing them because not every object action pair is of equal importance. So let's start here. In the book, I use in one of my case studies, a uh, dog adoption, uh, imaginary uh, organization, a nonprofit called Matchdog. And in software practice in general, our reference point for looking for nouns and verbs are the user stories. These may have to be stories that are extended by the UX team more than what engineering would do because many of their quote agile stories are just technical. But if you looked at the sum of the user stories that would define this pet adoption website, you'll have stories like as a parent, person object, I want to find action, a friendly attribute dog object that will help teach my children person object again to be responsible as an elderly widow, person object, living alone, I want to adopt, action, a dog, object, 
for my protection attribute. So it's as simple, honestly, when you're foraging as in thinking through all the user stories that are possible um, and getting out some markers and do the noun uh, and verb foraging activity. What you will get when you do this is a very sparse matrix, but you'll have all your candidates and a bunch of them will actually not even be legitimate candidates. So you might come up with a whole long list of objects. And for example, a calendar is a design pattern. So it doesn't belong in here in the first place. It's not an object, right? And you'll have more actions than you need. Um, and your goal is to basically compress this and you compress it in two ways. Number one, you wanna look for uh, which objects could be represented as attributes of other objects and then which actions can be represented as an attribute state change on a small set of objects. And it isn't really that hard. Students can get this in one class and come down to a matrix that's much smaller. So you could go smaller than the one on the right, but saying I can represent everything that this system needs to do with a dog, a potential owner, the organization itself and money, and only need to basically have donate, adopt, schedule, share, and learn. Um, and again, you can actually go more compressed than this, but typically we evaluate websites for like humane societies in cities all over the United States. And on average, they have 200 to 300 pages. And then in our first exercise in class on our new conceptual model, we spend six weeks redesigning with this in a lot more functional scope that I throw into the design brief and students on average can do it in 20 to 25 pages. So again, a 10x compression on their first try. Okay, so let's talk about attributes. The first question you should have in your minds is where do attributes fit in those formulas that I showed you for cognitive load? And the interesting part is that attributes don't add significant cognitive load. Why is this? They rely on a type of human memory uh, access called recognition, not recall. So humans are the best pattern recognizers of any uh, animal on the planet. We can hold large hierarchies of related attributes and relationships and pattern match them. We can recognize a species of dog that we have never seen before, um, but we, or you know, a breed of dog we've never seen before, but recognize it immediately as being of the species canine. This is an incredibly short abridged list of all the attributes of the animal, like it would have the age, breed, and a personality. This is its most important attribute because we have to match it in the system to a potential uh, adopter person. And then we get to prioritization. So in prioritization, if you have a human factors background, basically, and you're used to the terminology of tasks um, and task analysis, you can think of a task as an object plus one or more actions in combination. But all these object action pairs or tasks that people can do are not of equal importance to the user and also financially to the business model of the company. So there is a very important step here, which is to do an analysis and figure out by frequency and by volume, which object action pairs um, you want to prioritize. So frequent action object pairs that are done by many people should be available on the home screen in zero clicks, but certainly no more than one click away. And there are tasks that are done by many people rarely like create an account. It's important that they succeed, but uh, it is not gonna be um, more than once. And then in the financial world, if you have a click per pay, or pay per click kind of product, um, you will either want to have a financial row or column, either is okay, and understand what is generating micro revenue like advertising and what is generating macro revenue like a paid subscription, sign up, or putting something in a shopping cart. I tend to separate these. In enterprise products, you won't have this row, generally speaking. And in medical products, for example, you definitely won't have it. Um, you'll only have um, the top two. This alone saves a massive amount of time in iteration because often the first mocks um, 
two, three, four, five cycles. The entire discussion is about prioritization. You don't even really get to the point of having mocks that are worthy of assessment as a UX artifact. So if you just use this knowledge, just the grammar level immediately, what can you do? Well, there's three things. Number one, you can actually use this as a heuristic evaluation method to quantitatively assess cognitive load. Um, and then once you have figured out the actual grammar, AKA the conceptual model that the user interface is speaking its language, you can then figure out what the mismatches between that are and the a priori user's mental model that they bring. And in this case, I mean mental model in the context of the way Don Norman would write about it. And being quantitative is a whole lot more useful in my opinion than the qualitative heuristic approach that we've been using for decades based on Jacob Nielsen's initial work uh, literally more than two decades ago. And with no disrespect to Jacob, I actually co-authored a book with him in the 80s. Um, I think this is a better and more useful approach. If you're designing a new product from scratch, this is the only way to go because you're guaranteed to minimize the screen count and complexity before you even start to sketch if you figure out the tight uh, model. And obviously you'll save a ton of time um, by doing the prioritization activity with your stakeholders in advance. Um, I often teach the prioritization part just to product managers, irrespective of um, the UX team. If number three, you're dealing with the evolution of an existing product, which is where most work is done, then the takeaway is add every new piece of functionality if possible is an attribute change, a status change of an attribute to the existing objects that are defined intentionally or unintentionally in the current conceptual model of your product. And this will minimize um, the growth in cognitive load as um, you live with feature creep. So now let's talk about the layer two. Assuming you've got a tight grammar figured out, you have to visualize it. And visualization is non-trivial. You have to be able to um, blow out the visualization layer into its own hierarchy. And we start with the raw components, assemble them into design patterns of widgets. Archetypes are a screen template. If you are an SAP person and you're watching this, uh, archetype equals floor plan in SAP terminology. Um, and then we have the notion of a design language which is an interaction design language, not a visual design language, and then UX architecture. Let me clarify my terminology very quickly. The raw components of GUIs are very primitive like buttons and labels. You can assemble them into a widget that starts to look like uh, it has a time element to it. You add a few more controls and it becomes a date picker. And if you scale it up to an archetype, then it's a pattern for an entire screen, maybe in a pattern for an entire application. And it's a pattern that would be recognized by the majority of people living on this planet today. So let's start with components. I'm not gonna read you this table, but you'll recognize the list on the left is the main GUI components like buttons, links, icons, checkboxes. Almost all these components were designed by the uh, founders of GUI at Xerox PARC to represent the state of an attribute. A few of them like buttons were designed to represent an action, okay? The real question is, are you picking uh, and the components and using them properly and consistently? Designing an overall design language, I would get rid of about 30% of these X's, right? And be hyper consistent. You would never use like, uh, you should never use an icon, for example, to represent both an action um, and an attribute value and an object. This would just be really messy. Um, so let's look at an example that's well done. If we look at LinkedIn, LinkedIn right? LinkedIn uses the menu uh, component in multiple visualizations. The job screen um, is a menu of cards. The objects represented are the jobs. At the same time, and just off another uh, avatar or photo, LinkedIn has a menu of actions, right? And 
This causes no confusion because the menu of actions is visualized completely differently than the menu of objects. If this menu used cards like this, it would be a real mess. So they're okay. But let's talk about Yelp, my favorite source of a bad example. Right, and my grandmother always said of her numerous grandchildren, um, nobody's ever a failure. At least you can be used as a bad example to teach others. So that's kind of how I feel about Yelp. What do we have here with Yelp? So we have a misuse of the tabs, right? Where the first two are actually filtering the feed, but then the third one looks exactly like a tab is an actual action button, right? With the same color, same font, same icon, and to way too close in proximity. So it looks like it's part of these tabs, but this is a semantic mistake. And it might seem trivial to you, but this kind of mistake will kill a patient in a medical product. Now let's look at widgets. Widgets um, have their own <laughs> bucket of parts we can use in GUIs like cards and filter panels and wizards and property sheets. And if you're doing gamification, a leaderboard. Um, and they were generally designed to represent objects, occasionally some attributes. And here, what I would say is again, in your design system, erase at least 50% of these X's. And then when you use a card, a card should be hyper consistent, for example, to only represent an object, right? So don't make these decisions by trial and error, make them to reflect the semantics in your grammar layer. Now, here's an example of, again, what might look like a trivial mistake, but it's not. About six months before the book came out, the Google material team got wind of it. And they asked me to come give them a preview of the book and how it could be applied to what they're doing. And it was kind of fortunate in some way because for the medical product I was designing at the time that I showed you, the cancer one, we actually used Google material and we had to change a lot of it for safety reasons. But here's an example. The card um, in this style guide from Google basically is um, careless in representing examples where we have an object, a restaurant, and an attribute in the exact same treatment. And they specify a local action in the lower left corner of the cart. But this reserve action is transactional. Money is gonna change hands, right? The flow will advance. This action is non-grammar relevant. Expand only opens the cart to show more information. But they have the same location, same font, same face, same color, same all case, right? Again, this kind of mistake and inconsistency will kill a patient in a medical product. Now, you might think, okay, my list of uh, widgets was kind of short, but there are a whole bunch of them like toolbars and dialog boxes. They're not grammar relevant. They take on the grammar of the components you put inside them and controls that only change the view like zoom pan and scroll are not grammar relevant either. So you leave them out of your um, object action matrix. Now, if we go to archetypes, what are archetypes? Again, these are page templates that people understand. And there's a lot of them, like at the menu page from LinkedIn we looked at, um, a catalog for shopping, a desktop for your operating system, uh, social like Facebook or LinkedIn, tool in Canvas, anything from PowerPoint to AutoCAD, um, a workspace like uh, the coding environment of multiply uh, synchronized and choreographed child windows, et cetera. Here, you wanna get rid of 70% of the Xs and you wanna be hyper consistent in what exactly you're representing um, when you're pushing content through one of these archetypes. So let's take apart Facebook, for example. If we deconstruct Facebook, we'll see their global actions in the header. And then there's a lot of local actions floating in these cards down the side. Facebook really has two objects. If I were to uh, deconstruct it uh, as a non-Facebook employee, not ever having worked on its design, then the objects are pretty much people and posts and the content is just an attribute. But here's the mistake. And I know they changed this panel about six months ago, but with the exact same visual treatment, 
style of icons, et cetera. They're mixing objects, actions, attribute filters, and more actions all on the same screen. Um, and I know this screen um, and thing, this part has been very problematic for Facebook in spite of their success, because one of the UX architects for Facebook is one of my next door neighbors. Now let me talk about language, okay? Now, if you put these lower layers together, how do they really fit, right? And the question is, are you expressing uh, and implementing the grammar consistently? So here, I'm gonna give you a case study. I'm gonna take you through a day in the life of an object in an action in that medical example that I showed you before. To refresh your memory, this was the object action table, the conceptual model. And we're gonna first look at the appointment. So the appointment in the homepage for the doctor looks like a card and it's in the leftmost column and it's a homogeneous column of the appointment object. So cards are used for objects. If you click on a card, it expands. Now note, there are many to many, one to many and many to one relationships between all your data objects. So in this card, while the card represents the appointment object, there are attributes for the patient. And this is pretty important to the doctor, particularly on mobile UI, when they're running down the hall um, from consult room to consult room meeting with patients, they can actually look at the appointment and get the latest information um, about the patient as well as which room the patient is in. In this particular medical system, every object has a local action menu in the lower corner and the object menu, the action menu is contextual to the role of that individual. So for a doctor, it's pretty much creating tasks for the rest of the medical team, right? They're not gonna reschedule an appointment. So that's the appointment object, the way a doctor might encounter it most of the time, either sitting at their desk or more often on their phone. The front desk persona um, sees the same appointment object in a calendar pattern. And this would be so totally full, it would be distracting in a real clinic because now we're talking about hundreds of appointments for hundreds of patients, but it's the same. And the front desk person has a local action menu that's optimized for basically creating and deleting and moving appointments around. And then if we looked at how a nurse might look at the patient chart, the appointment object is shown on the landing page in a portal archetype pattern. Um, however, there's a slight difference and you can expand this and have all the appointments. Um, the local action menu is removed from the appointment because this page is specific to one patient. And so the local action menu now becomes the global action menu for the page. And there's a significant section in the book on the anatomy of actions and how they can morph from local to global and how to handle that consistently without increasing cognitive load. You'll also note that the attribute of the diagnosis related to the appointment is still in the card. Um, this may be for the primary diagnosis, which is shown in the header, but it could also be um, for something like uh, 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 temporary diabetes because some patients actually get the equivalent of gestational diabetes um, from chemotherapy. So that's a day in the life of the appointment object, hyper consistent, played out in many different archetypes. Now let's look at the void action. The void action is important because you don't delete data in a medical product. Um, if you ever do that, the FDA will shut you down. Here we're in the diagnosis screen and the card represents a diagnosis. And um, there is a medical error in this chart. And I know we have a lag in when you're hearing me. So I'm not gonna pause like I usually do and ask you guys to find a medical error. I'm gonna tell you where it is. Here we have um, a female patient with a prostate cancer diagnosis. So assuming that Erna did not have, excuse me, gender reassignment surgery, in which case she would have a prostate, but it would be in a different location than it was at birth. Let's assume that that isn't the case. And some internist who was busy coding was extra tired and they made a mistake. So we need to get this out of the patient chart. So um, the intern or the nurse or whoever's coding 
would say void the diagnosis, it struck out. If this include void filter is turned on, obviously we'd see the card, but the strikeout would be there. In general, this box is never going to be checked except for forensic purposes. So if we continue forward, okay, we click on the card, the card expands, and Staging cancer is very complicated and obviously beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but what I wanna show you is that the void action, even within the diagnosis, because the diagnosis has so many parameters for each stage, um, has a local behavior for voided as well as the global behavior for the whole diagnosis that you saw. And again, this is kind of covered um, in the book, um, and so actions are not only local and global, they're also implicit or explicit. And those all have to be managed very, very consciously to keep the grammar really, really tight and keep cognitive load down. So let's move on. If you were to go to the document screen um, in this patient's chart, again, somebody could load uh, an, a document for the wrong patient, right? So that has to be voided out. So you have the exact same behavior. Look at the journal notes, right? These are the free form notes doctors and nurses leave for each other. Same thing. You type something and um, you save it. And it's actually, you meant it to be for a different patient. You go to the local action menu and you void and note there is no undo in a medical product. If you wanted to actually say that again, and you realized you shouldn't have voided it, you're going to have to type it as a new record. And finally, I'm gonna to touch very briefly on architecture. What do I mean by architecture? Um, I don't exactly mean information architecture, I mean interaction architecture, but there is an overlap. So there are many navigation patterns. And in this diagram, think of a box as being a primary screen of some given archetype representing one or more of your most important objects. And we have serial, such as uh, checkouts flow or PayPal um, to move money around, traditional hierarchical organization of objects and sub-objects, hub and spoke, um, which is used often in journalism for websites, um, the matrix, um, where you can get to any screen, but you transit through other screens to get there. Um, and then the network where you have a loose federation of objects and you can navigate in context from any object to any other object main screen. All of these patterns have a series of eight human factors characteristics, like um, what is the location awareness? For the sequential, the location awareness is very high. For the network, it's kind of low to medium and the network and the matrix are patterns you would only use in probably very technical professional user products. Um, and again, they would have efficiency. Well, the efficiency of sequential is very low. The efficiency of navigating and working in the network if it's properly designed is incredibly high, which is why um, a lot of professionals um, actually like this. So the reason I bring up architecture is you will fine tune the grammar based on the architecture. While I'm kind of explaining this bottom up from grammar to game theory um, or from components to architecture, you actually in practice often pick your architecture and then will be modifying the grammar to optimize it for the architecture. In the case of that medical product, we considered hierarchical hub and spoke and network. Um, but I assure you that from the screens I showed you, you can't even tell which one it is. And the system is so modular um, and so precise, and there's so few screens that actually um, it could do any of them. Um, and in real life, we later added uh, a matrix model at the suggestion of a bunch of nurse practitioners. Okay, so that's all I wanna say about architecture. It's a multi-day lecture for the grad students, but understand that there's a huge interaction between architecture and grammar. So who understands all these patterns that I'm talking about? The answer is actually 5 billion people. Thanks to the internet and smartphone penetration, um, people come to every new screen 
whether it's on a kiosk at a bank or a new screen in a phone app or a new app they have to use at work or a new social service for interest, you know, for communication or shopping, five billion people are gonna have a priori models in their heads about how all these patterns fit together and what they represent. Interestingly, the other 2.7 billion, whether they're literate or not, and by literate, I mean can read, can only engage in the world of human computer interaction by associating physical world metaphors in their heads to objects and actions that they see on the screen. And this is actually the only way you can teach somebody who is not digitally literate because you're doing it through natural language and you're gonna describe everything um, whenever it's a new app and then it's your elderly parents um, by using nouns and verbs to explain to them what they can do. Obviously 99% of the digital economy is in that top 5 billion, but that doesn't mean we should ignore the other 2.7 billion. Now I'm gonna very briefly touch on flow and game theory and wrap up. Flow, the basic issue is, are you minimizing the number of steps um, through the, uh, the tasks? And obviously if you have the tightest uh, grammar, you're gonna have the fewest screens and you should have the fewest steps. So the message here is basically very simple. Actions propel objects through the flow. If we took the dog uh, pet rescue adoption site back to our matrix and we just looked at a simple donate flow, imagine now on the screen I'm gonna show you next, boxes represent objects and lines represent actions. And I use and teach the standard Jesse James Garrett method of how do you do boxes and arrows for experience flows that he invented probably 30 years ago. There's nothing better. But what you would see is a fairly simple flow, home screen, donate screen, thank you screen, maybe a volunteer screen. The donate call to action button, and we haven't even drawn the screen yet, is gonna propel the user to the donate screen. The pay action is gonna propel them to the thank you screen. And there's a bunch of objects that need to be represented at each of these um, junctures in the main screens. It's as simple as that. And when they're done, obviously based on some state logic, we'll determine whether to route them to one screen um, or route them to another screen that may or may not be the next part of a flow. So just remember, actions propel objects. The way I actually teach this is I teach um, in the classroom over the semester grammar a little bit, the very bottom of the visualization layer, a topic called grids and grammar. And then I teach flow and then I come back and hammer later on the full visualization stack. So finally, there's game theory. Um, and the issue of game theory is, can you motivate human beings to favor a specific object action pair? And the answer is yes. In the world of game theory, um, there are three flavors in interaction design. So setting aside pure games, where our goal is to raise cognitive load, every place else in enterprise, medical, and consumer, our goal is not to raise cognitive load, it's to keep it low. So there's the gamification flavor, which is the addition of reward elements to incentivize productive work. And I wanna put a plug in here for a book by another former SAP employee, Janaki Kumar, who wrote a really good book on this called Gamification at Work, but in the enterprise. Gameful design is a substitution of a proxy game for the actual transactional task. So this might seem a little theoretical, but imagine a screen that looks like Tetris, but once you've filled out all the puzzle pieces and all the shapes and colors are aligned, you've actually filled out an expense report and it's on its way to your boss to be signed. Captology stands for Computers as Persuasive Technology. Um, it is the work and it's originated with BJ Fogg at Stanford University two decades ago, which is using technology to persuade people to change their behavior, pretty often to convince them to buy something. So you see all these things like only one available at this price um, or you know, only this much time before this offer expires. That's all basically um, going into the digital world and trying to persuade people to do something. So the takeaway is really simple. If you map this back to the conceptual model world, gamification 
manipulates action incentives. Gameful design creates an object substitution layer in the semantic uh, interaction design. And Captology focuses on just manipulating attributes um, in the display of attributes or adding additional attributes like when the sale is going to expire. Um, why would you use game theory? Well, obviously we're trying to increase or decrease something in terms of human behavior. Uh, in the enterprise, we might be trying to increase productivity and reduce boredom. In the medical world, we might want to increase health and well-being and decrease um, some kind of um, unsafe behavior like skipping your meds, right? So you're targeting object action pairs that drive you um, towards any of these different types of motivations. And the specific human motivations that are in play fall into two buckets called intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is how we feel about ourselves and we're motivated by creativity and autonomy and extrinsic is how we believe we're gonna be perceived in the external world um, and the primary motivations that are extrinsic is greed and fear uh, of, and competition. But when you see things like um, uh, badges and um, things like that uh, and rewards, it's pretty much um, playing on the extrinsic side um, and competition of levels. When you go into any particular gamification design, um, you have a bunch of things that you're doing, right? You'll be targeting one or more of the extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. And this is the Nissan Leaf owner's portal, which has a beautiful gamification design. I actually don't know who the designers were, but I think they did a really great job. And there's a collaborative social game where drivers in different countries with their electric cars are competing with each other to create the largest carbon offset and the icon of a tree represents a unit of carbon offset. So you save trees. In the, and this is on the dashboard of the car as well. Not this whole graphic, but the, the trees growing. But if you refer to the game literature, there's a whole world of game mechanics um, that are used both in gamification and in pure games. Um, and there's about two dozen, but the ones that are most important for uh, semantic interaction design are ones like achievement, connection, narrative, etc. A game mechanic maps to a combination of a flow and one or more archetype patterns. So everything you know about uh, applied game theory and interaction design, um, you are basically operating on some pattern in the visualization layer you've selected and then a pattern above in the flow right? But it's 100% mapping. Game theory is everywhere. And this is a legally acquired slide from Facebook um, on their early um, game theory application. So they're particularly designing to induce social pressure, unpredictability, and scarcity. And these are the specific uh, mechanics that they use in driving you to hang around longer and longer and longer to show advertising. Um, you can use game theory for good. Most of my application of it is uh, in medical products on the patient side. And these are some screens from the Blue Star uh, Well Solution, it's diabetes type management, type two, and now type one um, from a company called WellDoc on the East Coast. And this is the first instance of digital medicine. Um, this is a digital only solution that is FDA class two um, has been shown in clinical trials in multiple countries to reduce the average A1C, or, which is a blood sugar level and high risk type two diabetics by two points. Medformin, which is the most popular uh, pharmaceutical for type two diabetes on average reduces A1C by 1.8. And at 6.5, you're a diabetic. At 6.0, you're pre-diabetic. This solution is prescribed by doctors and reimbursed by insurance companies. And it legally is a pharmaceutical. It has a pharmaceutical drug code. So your subscription to it is adjudicated through 
uh, things like Walgreens and CVS. It's pretty amazing that, and in these screens, now that I've told you the story, right, you will see the notion of challenges and badges and all kinds of game theory. It's a very smart expert system that knows all about you and connects to all your wearables and your blood glucose meter and your blood pressure meter um, to keep you on your meds, to keep you exercising, to keep your diet um, as uh, low carb as possible. So you can use all of this game theory for good and for truth in advertising. Um, I am a significant investor in this company and they are a, an active client. And I am using these screens with their permission. So that's the end of my preview. And we're just at the top of the hour. So we'll have time for questions. I've given you kind of a high speed flyby um, of the what, when, where, why, how, um, at my usual uh, take a drink from a fire hose pace of um, blasting information. I wanna remind everyone, again, the whole methodology is focused on turning you into a Jedi in this bubble, right? Don't forget the other steps. You need to do the whole thing. But this is my experience of 35 years in industry and now another um, almost approaching a decade uh, consulting is the main failure point for UX teams. You can get great research done and you can create a garbage design based on that great research. But do note, if the research is garbage, then you're in a garbage in, garbage out scenario. And as we say in California, um, you can never make good wine from bad grapes. So make sure you have good grapes at the research phase. There's a lot more to the book. Um, there's a chapter um, and these are the chapter names. The, every chapter is a one word name called elegance, which is pure graphic design. Um, you can screw up really good uh, conceptual model and proper visualization and flow selections with bad standard graphic design. And since there isn't a really good book on the topic, I put a chapter in, um, but it could be its own book. Um, so how not to mess up. And then myth, is a chapter that talks about the applicability of semantics to actual UI style guides. And the word myth tells you what I think about the effectiveness of almost all of these style guides that have ever been produced. Um, and a lot of the myth chapter is when you should follow and when you should ignore, primarily based on business considerations, not even usability considerations. And the last chapter, chess, is a rant on my part, very short of the complexity of the design profession and the future moves on the chessboard that designers are gonna be able to make. And um, this is not a short book. It's about 350 pages full color um, with tons and tons of illustrations. And there are exercises if you wanna follow along um, and try to do the same exercises that I use in class. Those are available at the publisher's website. The publisher is the Interaction Design Foundation the nonprofit in Europe. Um, and I already mentioned what's on this slide. You can get the book in paperback or Kindle format at Amazon. And just one addendum, and I'm gonna to flip to Q&A. For everybody who's uh, just an individual contributor, if you find this interesting, I um, would encourage you to post on social media and spread the word to your friends and designers within your company or at other companies. I've been doing this talk um, since January um, for free, and I've done it for now well over 30 universities, government labs, and corporations, many of them very much brand name, big corporations like um, SAP and professional societies like the Human Factors Society and UXPA. And I'll continue to ex um, accept requests to do private versions of this. Um, please join the Interaction Design Foundation and support them. It's very inexpensive and there's a ton of great content there. A lot of video, great um, encyclopedia of curated content as opposed to the crap you find all over the internet, most of which is wrong when it comes to the topic of UX. And finally, for managers, if you're interested, I also have all the materials and courses for how semantic interaction design intersects with data visualization and information architecture. I'm teaching a full semester class on this right now um, 
at San Jose State. So I don't have a book and I chose not to put these in the book because it would have taken another year, but perhaps um, another book will emerge eventually because all of these topics are orthogonal to each other. Interaction design, data viz, info architecture, they're all part of the larger Rubik's cube and semantics matter 100% of the time. Um, and that's it. So I am going to stop sharing. And I understand that if you are putting questions in the chat, they will come to my dear friend and colleague, Dale Waters, and he will aggregate and feed them to me. Yes, yes, Dan. So we've got a, a number of good questions. So there's a lot of, a lot of interest out there. And, and of course, the very first question that came in um, is, is uh, it says, please share the story about Microsoft and the tabs patent. So I think there's definitely some <clears throat> behind, behind, uh, behind that story. So I'm willing to do that, but you have to pause the recording. Oh. <laughs> so it, if you want, we can make that the last question. Why don't we make that the last question then? All right, so, so another question was, um, was uh, how, do you, um, how do you understand or measure cognitive load? So I know you talked about cognitive load earlier, but um, mm -hmm. there's some confusion about um, mm -hmm. how, how is it really best to understand that? So let, we'll talk, let me talk about the practical way and the serious theoretical way. The practical way for most user UX teams is that um, if you have somebody using the software in a usability lab and you have an eye tracker, pupil diameter turns out to be a proxy for cognitive load. It's a, it's a pretty accurate um, approximation. Um, I forget whether, I think it's pupil diameter contracting, but check the literature, right? Um, so you can see when somebody's using um, any product of yours and, and you've got a, even a moderately priced eye tracker, whether their cognitive load is going up and down. So that's actually pretty useful. You don't even need to know where they're looking, but of course you'll have that information in the eye tracker. Mm. Um, and that will give you a scalar value the same way that my object and action formula effectively gives you, a, it gives you an indicator, um, but it's not a parameterized metric. Um, the actual measurement technique that's most common is something called the NASA TLX measure. NASA being the guys who put rockets into space. Um, and go to the TLX uh, and it has different ways of measuring um, related with the environmental stress. And uh, it's pretty well-tuned metric because that's how they figure this stuff for um, astronauts. Um, and you'll figure out the metrics that they use. And I honestly don't bother with that for the most part. Um, right, it's a very academic way of doing it, but if you wanna know. But my, my, tool, my tip for the day is look at the pupil diameter um, as an easy way to um, figure this out in real time. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so another question that came in is about, um, does a product have only um, uh, one archetype? And they're giving the example of like, a, like the Facebook uh, page. A very simple sort of single function app, like find my car app would have one archetype. Most um, systems have many, right? And so if you looked at the medical product I showed you, we had swim lane archetype, we had social archetype, we had, um, oh, just a whole bunch. So it's fine to have multiple archetypes. They just have to behave consistently. And then your choices of widgets and controls and how they behave in those archetypes have to be hyper consistent. But I can't think of any product that I have ever designed in my career that was only one archetype because I have a tendency to do big medical and big enterprise. Yeah, and of course, every time you say the word archetype, I immediately think of floor plan. That's, right. That's my background. But uh, so another question is, uh, is on the same topic, um, but is the archetype defined by the content or the design style? So um, were you it's, it's really defined by the a priori mental model that 5 billion people have about what it holds and how you interact with it, right? So when you walk up to a kiosk at a bank, like a teller machine, you know, an ATM machine, 
it's going to, it's going to be a menu archetype, right? Um, you have expectations about where you can touch, what you can touch, what's going to be an action, what's going to be an object. For example, the objects are your accounts and your money, everything else on the screen is an action, right? So um, it's, it's kind of the, the uh, integral of, above the curve of all that stuff um, in people's mental model. And then the question is in your grammar, you're designing the language that you communicate um, mm -hmm. that to them. And the more consistent you are and the more compact you are, um, the happier everybody's gonna be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great, thanks. So just again, following up on that, um, uh, another question that came as, in was, could you please explain how interaction design uh, well, I'm not quite sure the word can outperform medications. So I think this is in relation to um, the medical app example you gave uh, mm -hmm. with uh, mm -hmm. diabetes application. Um, but sure. I, yeah. So the solution that I showed you the screens of, um, and this is all commercially available, um, is basically a coach. So in terms of uh, diabetes care management, in the old days, and still today, you could have a healthcare organization that provided uh, like a mentor who would call and check in with you every two or three days, right? So they're your buddy, but it was a human being um, and help you um, and encourage you emotionally and in terms of content to stay on the right diet, to exercise properly. So now if you basically take a pool of people um, who are high risk type two diabetics, and leave them alone and you take another pool and you give them this solution and they tend to interact with it four or five times a day and it connects to your watch and it, um, you know, it can connect to your, uh, your uh, blood glucose meter, which will be Bluetooth. Um, and it's basically there to encourage you and, and be your buddy and monitor you. And you're basically living healthier. But the thing is uh, you're living healthier with no medication side effects. Right? This is the reason doctors will prescribe it. There's absolutely no risk to a doctor um, to try something like this because there's no drug interaction with a digital solution on your phone. And it's been from you know, teenagers to people in their 80s and 90s. It's available in multiple countries. It's gonna be in Japan very soon um, as well. And so it's behavior management. It's almost, you, know, you could think of it as captology. You're persuading people to change their behavior to maintain a healthier lifestyle. It's very sophisticated. Um, the RX version can dose insulin. So this product, this could kill you, hmm. right? Um, the over-the-counter version um, doesn't have the insulin dosing feature and other things that require FDA approval. Um, but it's your buddy. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a great example of sort of like the uh, guided assistant or, um, a, you know, kind of um, <clears throat> online buddy that helps you complete tasks. And yeah, if cool. you're interested, I assume there's a video of this, but several years ago, I did a talk on this in detail at an open IDO session at the D school at Stanford. I assume it was recorded. So probably on the um, open IDO website you could probably find that talk on digital medicine where I explain this and another uh, diabetes product, um, which is an artificial pancreas, which is um, even more sophisticated, um, but it's not so much behavioral because you're actually putting stuff in people's bodies, mm -hmm. but you run it, you run it from your phone. You, it's a body hack. Very cool. Yeah, great. So another question, of course, is will the presentation slides be available? And and I don't think so, but we will have the recording available later. Well, I can I can make the slides available. I, if, okay. if, if I assume HANA House has a way to distribute them. I, I, yes. I mean, we can through HANA House. Sure. No, no problem at all. Okay, great. Um, so this is more of a comment rather than a question, but I'd like to get your reaction. It says, today's designers are not aware or follow these um, UX design methods very, very often. And uh, so, so that's, a, that's a comment. And I'm just curious uh, how you, uh, if you agree with that or disagree, what do you think uh, about So that? I'm gonna answer the question at a couple of levels. Great. Um, it's an important topic. 
Today, the practice of interaction design is overly intuitive and it doesn't need to be. That's what I'm telling you. This is a better method. And my goal is to get the entire profession to adopt it. That might sound ambitious, but it would not be the first time I've done that in my career. The book, Human Factors and Product Design, came out in 1990, co-authored with Bill Cushman, was the first human factors book that was consumer product focused. All previous ones until 1990 were medical systems, uh, not medical, I'm sorry, military focused, right? And that became the standard textbook uh, in industrial design and in um, industrial engineering for a decade around the world. Even in Korea, somebody recently told me it's the second most popular design book in Korea after uh, Don's um, Psychology of Everyday Things book. Mm. Um, so education has to do its part. I spoke recently, keynote at the DMI academic conference, trying to convince all the design professors in the world, right, to go this path and learn it themselves because there are too many design pedagogies that are just hyperintuitive. Mm. And you don't need to do that. There's plenty of room for creativity. The original system for designers is screwed up. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about boot camps like General Assembly all the way up to PhD programs. Um, I gave this talk uh, right after the book came out at Carnegie Mellon in person before we had to shut down. And again, when they, divide, they start using it and teaching to this pedagogy, we are, I'm on the board of the HCI program at UC Irvine. So it'll take it a while. Um, but I also wanna make a final point because this is a significant one. And I want um, all of you to take this very seriously. I am on the board of an AI company that's implementing this book. This is such a reliable Lego-like concept that you can teach it to an AI. And that company not only can generate UI, the product is in pilot in the market today. It only knows a certain set of subset of archetypes right now. It can't do everything. Um, it writes the code. So it can not only do the design, but it'll push the code into GitHub for you. And you can even pick your um, UX system, whether it's um, Angular or React, it doesn't matter. It actually knows them all. So if as a designer, you can't level yourself up to this kind of performance, right? Um, you're at risk, right? Uh, you're at risk. I don't think this AI will be able to do the really, really hard stuff. It's not gonna design a cancer treatment system, but it can design a significant part of the low hanging fruit. Um, and it can do it better than anybody who's really not trained up at the level that this book um, brings to the table. Maybe, uh, so, so another question is, is what designers are using your method today? Are there case studies we can look at? And, and um, before you answer, I, I would happen to say, I, I noticed uh, in your presentation, actually a screen I worked on uh, when I was working for you, um, mm -hmm. where we, where we um, boiled a uh, sales manager's role and responsibility down to, I think, three components and mm -hmm. saw that represented on the page. So mm -hmm. that was kind of exciting, but, but um, yeah, are there, are there some case studies or, or, um, you know, there's, where can people see this applied? So um, there's two case studies that fall, that flow through the book. Um, one is imaginary. It's the match dog one. And the other is the medical product that I showed you. There's two problems with the case studies. One is what companies do is just generally considered um, their own business. And so they're not very interested in making it public. Um, but if you were to look at um, companies in particular, and you were to go and I'll plug SAP, then I had nothing to do with this. The SAP design system that is the standard, it's still Fiori, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, has a lot of semantics in it. Yep. It's not complete. It could be better, yep. but um, its architect, uh, I still believe is Kai Richter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people working on it. Um, you can deduce from the SAP Fiori a lot about the semantics that SAP is using. They don't publish everything, 
but they do publish a lot. Um, and you can see it in that whole um, the website and standard. Um, more complete, um, but still quite incomplete. You won't find enough of this in Apple. You'll find none of it in Google. You'll find, frankly, none of it in IBM's Carbon. Those are all just visual systems. Um, but you can really get the idea for semantics and how it would interact um, best in terms of publicly available sources in Fiori. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and and so another question is is about um, uh, what do you think about the atomic design system uh, created by Brad Frost? I, um, yeah. Uh, so the atomic design system, it's a beautiful kind of infographic using the periodic table for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is specific to HTML components, right? So it attempts to deal with the modularity uh, and has a cute way of describing them and how to be consistent and efficient, but it only applies to the component level of the visualization uh, hierarchy. So it's a necessary, but not sufficient uh, view of the world. Um, but the premise you know, starts in a similar way that if you're consistent at the component level, right, you're gonna get a better user interface, but it doesn't go above the component level. And it says nothing about the grammar, the underlying conceptual model. Um, so it's more to me, um, a HTML coding perspective of modularity, not uh, a complete system of interaction design. Interesting. But it's a cool book. Yeah, it definitely is. I, I, so I, I wanted to go back and, and ask you to, if, if you could follow up uh, a little bit more about sort of the intersection between AI and, and this uh, semantic interaction design method. Um, and maybe this relates more to your, the last chapter in your, in your book where you, uh, the chess chapter where you talk a little bit more about the, the, the future and, and where you see, um, uh, I would say, sort of designers uh, and how they need to work uh, as you see it in, in the future. Okay. So let me say a little bit more about the AI um, without disclosing a lot because this is a very new startup. <laughs> um, AI systems, there's a lot of different kinds of AI and the terminology is overused too much between weak AI and strong AI. But fundamentally you can break the AI world down into machine learning, like what you would do for um, driving a car right? Right. A lot of pattern recognition um, or the traditional expert system model where there's rules, right? And you're codifying a set of rules. You can take the full semantics of graphical user interface and you can create a knowledge graph. Yeah. And then if the input to that knowledge graph happens to be the objects and actions and the prioritization matrix, an AI can find the optimal um, patterns, archetypes, and the optimal flows, mm. right? Within the scope of the knowledge that can be represented in the graph. So if you know anything about knowledge representation and just based on what I presented today, you should be able to envision that such a graph can exist. Mm. And such a graph would be highly proprietary intellectual property, mm. okay? But the system is modular enough, is the way I've described it, that you can create the graph. Turning the graph into code is not my part of the problem, but that's actually not um, known computer science, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the general space. So I, I hope that kind of clarified. Now, mm -hmm. so then the question pops up to, okay, so then what is the role of the human being that's left? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And the role of the designer is figure out what the hell people need to meet their goals, right? The AI can't understand the problem. You still have to describe the problem, but you can imagine that a really good product manager who could create all the user stories and create the product prioritization matrix, right? And then interact with the AI. It's not a one shot through, right? It, it actually has a conversation with the um, human being at the other end of the screen um, to also get input from the human being on the options that the AI is thinking about um, and get some guidance. 
The problem of figuring out the requirements um, and articulating those requirements in a way that are executable, right, to get up to the uh, a beginning of the semantic model is going to be a human problem, I would say, at least for another 100 years, mm -hmm. right? Certainly not in my lifetime. But it levels up the value prop, right? Because the human is still the problem solver. The AI is just one more step up the food chain from your standard old uh, libra coding libraries like React or Material or in Angular, right? I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's just at this point with leverage human intellect still, it's not going to replace the deep thinking. Yes, well, that's that's good to know that uh, designers will, will still be around and <laughs> still be working, hopefully, for the next uh, hundred years or so, or in some in some capacity. Um, right. Uh, question is: uh, Do you have an online course we could take on this subject, or perhaps uh, any other courses uh, of interest that that you can share with us? Um, I do not have an online course yet. However, I was just on the phone today with Lou Rosenfeld, or I should say Zoom, we don't have phones anymore, of Rosenfeld Media. And they put on a lot of web-based uh, uh, interactive training as well as conferences. And so we are discussing a, a one-day workshop um, type of uh, deep dive into, I can have one day, two day, and up to four day of corporate training already designed that I've given in person and I do remotely. So if your company really wants to, I can do it live. Um, and the thing, I guess, with Rosenfeld Media would still be me live. Um, eventually, I will probably make some video training because the Interaction Design Foundation, my publisher, is very big on that. Um, that's just very time consuming. And uh, it quite honestly is very hard um, to do something this abstract, purely video only, without the ability to interact with the students. Um, yeah. The minute they don't get something, you have to stop, right? Otherwise, the next two hours of video would just be nonsense. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Well, I see we're just about out of time, Dan, and I think we've been through most of the questions in the chat. And uh, so I would just ask, are there any... Um, any final words that you'd like to share um, with the group about, about the book or what you're doing? Well, I'm, my hope um, is that you will all become engaged in this method, learn it and spread it and evangelize it, right? I, we as a profession need to level up. Um, and when you look at the world of UX and learning UX and keeping sharp, you'll see that there's three kinds of knowledge. Durable knowledge, like statistics, right? Doesn't change, right? Tools, which change all the time. And trends, like conversational UI versus AR, VR. Mm -hmm. Semantic design applies to all trends. It is totally applicable to conversational UI, but we've run out of time. Um, but this is probably, in my opinion, the most important new durable knowledge. There is no book like this, right? I mean, even Don said that after you look, read it, right? There's nothing like it. Um, and that should be the platform that we grow as a profession on until somebody comes up with something better. And I hope somebody does. But for now, let's level up, right? Um, and bring everybody with you, become a Jedi and train other Jedis. I, I love that. That's a great, that's a great comment. And, and I think so oftentimes we um, see designers often um, thought of more for um, their knowledge of tools or skills related to that. And so um, when we think about the challenge uh, that's in front of us uh, and, and really the, the, um, the value of, of um, building our, our durable knowledge uh, and, and expertise, I think that's a great challenge uh, for all of us. So I would just like to conclude uh, this, this session of, of Design Bytes. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we'll be doing another session uh, next month. Special thank you, uh, Dan Rosenberg, for uh, all of your insights. And uh, please do um, check out his book, UX Magic. 
uh, and um, it's, it's certainly well worth uh, the read. Thanks, everyone. Okay, goodbye. Thanks for hosting. <laughs>